Each week, the Bible as Literature podcast brings you in-depth discussion of the biblical text in a format short enough for your morning commute, but long enough to be substantive, posing difficult questions meant to keep you engaged. If you value this work, please consider donating as little as 25 cents per episode. That's just $1 per month. To learn more, please visit patreon.com forward slash Bible. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com forward slash Bible. Thank you. Hi, this is Father Mark Bulos with the Bible as Literature podcast. The proclamation of the forgiveness of sins is integral to the content of the gospel. After all, it was the forgiveness of sins that opened the path for Gentiles to become children of the Bible. In the Gospel of Mark, the sharing of this news is the single priority of Jesus Christ, so much so that Jesus is constantly on the move, teaching and preaching. With this in mind, it seems odd that Jesus would say, whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness. It seems odd, that is, until you realize that Jesus is frustrated with those who willfully oppose his Father's teaching. You know, that teaching where everyone is forgiven, no matter who they are, where they pray, or who claims them as family. Richard and I discuss the Gospel of Mark, chapter 3, verses 28 to 35. You're listening to the Bible as literature. Hi, this is Father Mark Bulos. And this is Dr. Richard Benton. And you are listening to episode 152 of the Bible as Literature podcast. Personal piety is the lens through which people often filter scripture. Instead of looking at context, both narrative and historical, they begin with, what does this mean to me? And if you approach scripture that way, you're going to go crazy. And one classic example is this morning's passage which has been taught wrong in church school for as long as I can remember, and left countless children fretting over whether or not they're going to hell, which is this idea of the one sin that can't be forgiven, which is the sin against the Holy Spirit. People hear this and they start thinking, did I have a bad thought about the Holy Spirit? What does it mean to disobey the Holy Spirit? Oh my goodness, if I disobeyed the Holy Spirit or blasphemed against the Holy Spirit, am I done for life? All of this kind of talk is so far off track from what's actually happening in the text because we approach everything as an individual, we individualize the Bible, and it doesn't work. And it's funny, people even say, I've had people say to me, Father Mark, how can you apply the Bible to society? The Bible is meant to apply to individuals. Not the way that you mean it applies to individuals. It applies to individuals a la the Gospel of Mark which means it blames you for what's happening to the group, but the issue is the group, not the individual. People use it and twist it for all different reasons because they think that the spirit has something to do with emotions or they think it has to do with who knows what. People make it up. People fill in the blank because nobody has an accurate way of understanding what this spirit is. Let's talk about the way the spirit functions in Acts. The Holy Spirit is what guides the apostles to go where they need to go or prevents them from going someplace so that they can teach and deliver the message. The wind that moves to and fro upon the face of the earth in the New Testament, in the Gospel of John, is the wind that God blows upon the earth in the Old Testament. It's the wind that man can't control. It's the wind that has its own will. It's the wind that only God can control. The Spirit carries the word wherever it wants to carry the word. As we talked about when we were doing Ecclesiastes, a metaphorical phrase the Bible uses for foolishness is someone who tries to shepherd the wind. You can't control it, you can't guide it, you can't lead it, you can't move it, it goes where it wants to go. Only the Lord could still the waters by controlling the wind. That's why Jesus can still the waters with a word. Only the Lord has control over the elements. It's classic biblical imagery. So it's presumptuous 
to imagine that you can control where Jesus carries the scroll in the first three chapters of Mark. Don't forget the beautiful passage from Ezekiel 37, where we have the dry bones. The dry bones are animated by the wind, by the spirit. It's the same word, ruach, in Hebrew. But how does the wind enter into the bones? The Lord says to Ezekiel, prophesy. Prophesy, and this is what allows the spirit to enter into the dry bones. Teaching the word, preaching the word, goes right along with the Holy Spirit. The spirit is what animates the body, too. It's what animates the human being. But you can have different kinds of spirits motivating the human being. You can have a spirit of the devil. You can have a Holy Spirit, a spirit of God. So one has to be careful of what spirit one is manifesting in one's actions. The key in Mark, when we talk about the sin against the Holy Spirit, which we'll hear from Jesus in just a moment, is that it pertains to one's position relative to the movement of Jesus. If you are trying to undermine Jesus by accusing him of being the Satanas, which is what the Pharisees just did in the previous section, or if you are one of those who are nearby him, listening to him, who want to seize him so that he can't move to teach more people. If you're one of those among the selfish crowds who are interested in getting something for themselves from Jesus and don't care about his greater mission. If you are any of those functions in Mark, you are committing blasphemy against the Holy Spirit because by blocking Jesus for whatever motivation or reason, by blocking Jesus, you are working against the agenda of the Holy Spirit. The agenda of the Spirit is to carry the Torah, the scroll of God's teaching, out to the nations. So if you want to properly contextualize the sin against the Holy Spirit, it's when you're sitting in a parish meeting and someone says, we should have an extra session of Bible study, and everyone rolls their eyes and says, no, we don't have time. That's the sin against the Holy Spirit. And the reason it can't be forgiven is because if you are not enabling the teaching, there's no hope for you. It's not magic. It's not like a curse or a blessing in a pagan or a secular sense, like a superstition. If you're preventing it from going out, then your profession on your lips that you believe in this teaching is nullified because you can't manifest both a prevention of the word from going out and trust in the word at the same time. How can you be forgiven of your sins when you are not enabling the teaching that explains to you that your sins are forgiven? That's the sin against the Holy Spirit. Truly I say to you, all sins shall be forgiven the sons of men and whatever blasphemies they utter, but whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness but is guilty of an eternal sin. So like you said, Father, this is not saying don't step the wrong way or else you're going to hell. That's not what it's saying. It's saying as long as you prevent the teaching and oppose the teaching, God cannot remove that sin from you. Now the specific example in the next verse, verse 30, that aroused the anger of Jesus, that aroused the ire of Jesus, is the fact that not the crowds but specifically the elders and the teachers of the people uttered a lie. Those who are responsible for carrying the teaching out not only were blocking it, but were uttering lies willfully in order to block it for selfish gain because they were saying he has an unclean spirit. So the ones assigned to teach the Pharisees are uttering a lie. They know scripture. They see the work that Jesus is doing, they hear him teach, they know better, and yet they oppose him. It's willful, selfish rationalization. It's like at work when you know someone is right, but you still argue against them just because you don't want them to be right. And if you're dealing with the Lord, the Messiah, the King on the Lord's mountain, Zion in the heavens, and he is bringing to you God's teaching and you rationalize for self-justification against him and lie about him, how can you be forgiven? How? And this may even relate to the people who wanted to grab him because they were saying he has lost his senses. It's possible that 
losing one's senses can be related to having an unclean spirit. If they were nearby and they heard the truth and then they accused him of being crazy and tried to seize him and keep him from going out, they are in the know because they've received the teaching and they're working against that which they received. This is the idea. It's when you know the truth, but you willfully work against it in order to serve your own agenda. There's a reason that Jesus refers to the devil as the father of lies. Because when someone tells lies, no matter how small, those lies work against their own well-being over time. And lies multiply themselves, lies undermine whatever little bit of honesty is left in a person, and it gets to a point where they become crazy. And there's nothing anyone can do because there's no baseline. And we've already seen the psychological problems of the scribes and the Pharisees and the people because Jesus has repeatedly pointed out their false presuppositions. The basis for insanity is the false presupposition. It begins with incorrect brain pathways attributable to dishonesty. How can you forgive dishonesty if people live in a fantasy? That's the sin against the Holy Spirit. Oh, well, I've been telling people all along they should be out on the street corners preaching the gospel to every passerby. If you're not doing that, then you're sinning against the Holy Spirit. We're not saying that because the person who's preaching on the street corner may not understand the way that the Holy Spirit is moving outside of his own sphere of understanding. We see these communities where we would not expect the Holy Spirit to be functioning in a church unlike ours, in a religion unlike ours, in a people unlike ours. We cannot prevent the Holy Spirit from functioning there. This is also a sin against the Holy Spirit. The best defense against falling into the trap of the lie and self-delusion and the blasphemy against the Spirit, where you would be so self-serving that you would trash Jesus Christ publicly. The best defense against that is to constantly put yourself under judgment and to put your own shortcomings and your own mistakes and your own selfish interests on display for others to critique. That is the best path. That is the biblical path. The disciple of the scriptural God loses face. He doesn't save face. And once you understand that, you no longer feel the need to cover up, to lie, to rationalize, to defend. To further your agenda. You just submit, and then there's hope. It's a very important matter. John dropped his agenda. The Pharisees and the scribes refused to drop their agendas. Then his mother and his brothers arrived, and standing outside, they sent word to him and called him. A crowd was sitting around him, and they said to him, Behold, your mother and your brothers are outside looking for you. This sounds suspiciously like before when Jesus tried to sneak out of the house, and they were saying, Everybody has been looking for you. Jesus can't be held down. He's not going to be held down by a group of people. He's not going to be held down by an identity. The word has to continue going. And family here represents identity. It represents clan. It represents lineage. It ties back to what we said about the names of the apostles, the emphasis on Jacob, Israel. Whether it's Yaakovos, Yaakub, which is James, or it's Judas, who represents Judah, Judea, it's all the same metaphor. Jesus' lineage is being devalued. Notice how people talk when they talk about their religion. They always talk about their founder, their connection to their founder, their history. All churches, all traditions, all families, all nations, everyone talks this way. Scripture is the only tradition that disallows this entirely. You can't claim a lineage. You can't claim any heritage that sets you apart from anyone else because the only thing that counts is God. And God speaks to whomever he wants and his spirit sends his word wherever he wants upon the earth. You can't control him. And notice the family comes in as another mechanism of control. Jesus, your mom is here. Your brothers are here. You have a place in the world. Don't forget. And what does Jesus say? Answering them, he said, who are my mother and my brothers? Are you kidding me? Who are you going to claim as my mother? Do you think because Mary gave birth to me that I belong to her? Which is how people talk. 
Here, the mother and brothers want to, just like the people who wanted healing, wanted a piece of Jesus. And Jesus can't be stopped. Jesus has one affiliation, and that is the one who needs to hear the teaching. That's it. That's all he does. Even those who already heard the teaching, he has less interest in than those who need to hear the teaching. Looking out about at those who were sitting around him, he said, Behold, my mother and my brothers, don't tell me who my family is. My family is the human race. This is exactly how Dr. King spoke in the 60s. We are all God's children, and we all have one father. And if you can't treat the mother of your next door neighbor as though she were your own mother, if you're trying to defend your mother, which is how people are, they put their family first, this American expression, family first, is evil. It's anti-scripture. What do you mean family first? And the people that are all trumpeting this expression are all Christians. As though somehow this is a Christian value. No, the biblical value is that God is our Father, which makes everyone our family. So then, if you're going to believe that, then family is first, which is what Jesus is trying to do. He's undermining the presupposition of who owns you. Who owns Jesus? The people who own Jesus are the ones who have not yet heard the teaching. Those are the ones Jesus is out to serve. For whoever does the will of God, he is my brother and sister and mother. The affiliation to, as you say, God as the father, and not these people who entered the house as your brother, sister, and mother. These are what define Jesus' affiliation. So far in chapter 3, we've seen everyone want a piece of Jesus. The Pharisees want to define who he is. His disciples want to define who he is. John's disciples want to define who he is. Now this mother and brothers want to define who he is. The people, the crowds, the people who want healing want to define who Jesus is. And Jesus is one thing. He is a word that is to go out to the nations and only a few people who are themselves without words or who are with very few words around Jesus are the ones who actually believe in him, who actually trust in the word that he's going to teach. Thanks very much, Dr. Benton. That's a wrap for this week's episode. I want to remind our listeners to visit us online at ephesusschool.org. Please join the conversation. Give us your feedback, your comments, and we'll continue to work on this collective Bible study. All right, see you online. Take care. Thank you, Father. You've just heard the Bible as literature. Thanks for listening. The Bible as Literature is a production of the Ephesus School Network.